So thank you for indulging me in that little introduction to the place that I like to call where you currently are. And I'm going to pass it off to Rebecca Shappas and Imbar Hagai. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we are super excited uh, to begin Rust Belt uh, Renegade, a two-part event highlighting moving image artists working in and coming out of DIY and punk aesthetic movements of Pittsburgh filmmakers throughout uh, the 70s and 80s. Tonight's event is a screening and a lecture by visiting artist Peggy Awish. Awish was a programmer at Pittsburgh Filmmakers from 1980 to 1982 um, and was immersed in the local film and arts culture. Tonight's talk will begin with a screening of selected works ranging in date from 1992 to 2017. This small survey of Awish's catalog evokes the extra extraordinary range of cinematics um, methodologies taken up by her work over the course of nearly four decades. While the works in this evening employ a range of cinematic, cinematic expressions, sorry, I cannot see. They are connected by Awish's continual testing of the boundaries of uh, documentary filmmaking her mastery of the montage as a medium, and her aptitude of appropriation of ready-made media to shed light on pressing social and political conditions, often reflecting upon mass media itself. This screening will be followed by remarks from Peggy and a Q&A. Cool. So this weekend's events were made possible by the 2022 to 2023 Sylvia and David Steiner Speaker Series at the Frank Ratchy Studio for Creative Inquiry. We would like to thank the studio, um, which includes Nika, Harrison, Bill, Linda, and Olivia, Pittsburgh Sound and Image, Stephen Haynes, Hannah Kinney Cobra, and Steve Felix for their promotion and curatorial support for tomorrow's event. Um, please be aware that some of tonight's films include animated sequences of violence, so take care of yourselves however you need to. Um, and now we'll get into an introduction of Peggy. So over the course of her career, Awesh has produced one of the most heterogeneous bodies of work in the field of experimental film and video. Her tools include narrative and documentary styles, improvised performance and scripted dialogue, sync sound films, found footage, digital animation, and crude pixel vision video. Using this range of approaches, she has extended the project initiated by 1960s and 70s American avant-garde film and has augmented that tradition with an investigation of cultural identity and the role of the subject. And so if Peggy wants to give a few words before we start the screening, let's give a little welcome. Uh, I'm going to get a picture taken with this pose. <laughs> Let's see if I'm going to sing. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. I want to thank Inbar and Rebecca for organizing my event and talking to me on email from many, many times about where we could, what we could do in the, with this weekend and about the program. And they curated tonight's uh, screening, which I really appreciate. And um, I'm looking, I'm looking forward myself to seeing how it all plays. Um, I left Pittsburgh in 1982, which was a terribly, terribly long time ago. But I always carry part of Pittsburgh with me. And I always, it, is, it was very foundational to me as an artist. And although my work isn't as scruffy and punk-like as it was then, <laughs> it has evolved in different ways. There's still some kernel of um, sort of the renegade, sort of, uh, I think, in all the work. I mean, the, the work you're seeing tonight is very diverse, so if you don't like one movie, just wait till the next one. It'll be very, very different. Uh, and I'll be back later, maybe, I'll be back later? I'll be back later um, and so, to maybe just chat a little bit about them. 
I should just explain maybe the two animation pieces that you saw back to back. They're both synced to the same music. And usually I show it as an installation where you don't look at them one and then the other. They're kind of installed in the space in this configuration. And configuration is kind of like this. So you, you get the impact of both of them, but you can't, um, you can't take it all in at once and sort of you are able to move around the space. And it's a very different experience. But I mean, I like them as a single channel work. It's kind of my bread and butter from my background. But uh, I, I do have this other, ver this installation version. Uh, I made the one, the black a C, um, about the hubris of humans in relationship to nature and the story of the whale. And then, this, then, this, then I made the second one, The Falling Sky. It's about, more about uh, technology and uh, surveillance. And each, I, I got really obsessed with this um, uh, database that's online by these Taiwanese animators. I didn't do the animation myself. I did the editing of the material. And I basically, it's found footage. But I got really obsessed with this uh, database. It's a Taiwanese organization that uses these little animations to tell news stories. And I thought, maybe some of you know it, I thought, wow, have we come to this virtually where news is being told with CGI, very simple animations. I thought it was completely fascinating and disturbing and cutified. Cutifi there's a cutification of the news. Uh, maybe it's easier to watch, but the, the, the conundrum of those, all those issues kind of came together for me. So that, that's, um, I've made a, a number of works based on that particular uh, database, or I call it a database, I'm what they call it, but there's hundreds and hundreds of these videos. They're all very, very short, like 45 seconds. But I wanted to say that in each one, you might have noticed there's, they're all news events, each, each little clip, although I kind of compiled them all in some crazy Peggy way. But in the first one, there's the little Syrian boy on the beach, which image you might notice. And it, each video has a particular uh, clip that is so recognizable, and it's just kind of shocking to see in this format. And it kind of brings you back to the news in a, a really potent way. The second piece has a footage of Michael Brown, who was shot by the police in Ferguson. It was left on the street for a number of hours. There's this, a shot of it, a cop shooting him. But I, I, wanted, I, I didn't want it to be sort of all news. It's all news, but I didn't want it to be all like hyper recognizable. But in each m movie, I wanted something that would kind of bring you back, the viewer, back to some sense of um, history and politics and kind of what every individual, whatever their take is on it, just bring you back to the sort of world of uh, on the ground, the world as the world is, the violence of the world as it is. Um, so that, that's, that, uh, that's that piece. <laughs> um, I like to mess around with technologies quite a bit. and. Um, the warm, uh, warm objects I had gotten, there's a credit for Princeton on the end of the, uh, the video. Um, a woman at Princeton had gotten this $50,000 camera, which she loaned to me. Uh, uh, she got it from a grant, and she, she was testing poor neighborhoods and how much heat loss was coming from their houses. That's what she was doing with a heat-sensitive camera. And I just did this other thing altogether. I just went out in New York and wandered around with, a, with that, the camera and shot crazy stuff. And I was like, wow, it's either used for scientific observation, but mainly for military, to sort of see what people are doing at night and to sort of spy on people with this crazy you know, infrared uh, technology that generates images th from heat into what they call pseudo color. So that, that it's a beautiful to, to me to look at. But I try to do something that was against the use of the technology to do something uh, else with it to allow it to uh, ev evoke something about the city and the and the heat heat of the city and the last one's a drone so I guess I mess around with technologies quite a bit uh, it was really fun to shoot in Kansas with the drone really fun I'm not that good at it um, but I um, really enjoyed uh, working with it and I, I shot all the footage and then I kind of had the idea basically afterwards of the the uh, significance of being in Kansas. 
And this, I shot most of the footage in like 2016. You know, Trump, the beginning of the Trump presidential, at that time, Kansas is a very conservative state. You know, it's the home of the Koch brothers, for example, and uh, Operation Rescue. You know, that's, I mean, it's a really interesting, co complicated place. As the center, as a, in a way, a hollow center in relationship to the coast. So I was like, I just sort of started to work with that uh, as a metaphor and sort of expand this kind of idea of the center, the hollow center, the periphery. And um, there literally is that little monument to the center of the country, the, f the lower 48 states. It's at the end of, well, you saw it in the movie. It's the end of this little road. It's a dead end at this little plot of land with a little plaque. That's our center, Lebanon, Kansas. Anyway, so that's uh, kind of how that one got started. Each one has a story. Any questions or thoughts about anything? Yeah. Is there anything you might say? Yeah, sure. Must speak into the microphone. Into the microphone. Okay, cool. Is there anything you might say about the first one? Um, the first film, you know, that's from the 90s. You know, I worked... Um, Boy, that's really taking me back. I shot that in 16 millimeter. And um, it started, uh, well, the jokes are cool, right? The, it's all the sex jokes, the Freud jokes. But it's kind of like joke tell. It's an essay film, so it's not supposed to all add up. But it's like jokes and uh, Freud. And then Duchamp made those rotoreliefs. It's about, it's about circularity and repetition and dizziness and hypnosis. You're going to spin around and round in this relationship. Where is meaning? Where is meaning? I'm losing meaning. The record player, the records go around, and they're stomping on the records. So it's just this gaggle of girls and um, sort of uh, playing around with this notion of uh, the unconscious and its relationship to humor. Um, and there's a passage. Uh, the, the, the last se section is a quotation from a Bunuel film. It's called Vir Diana, if anybody's seen it. And that Indira takes a picture with her body. And according to Lacan, it's the camera her daddy gave her. And it flashes like that. And they appear as the, last, uh, as the disciples from the Last Supper. So that's a quotation from Bunuel. But it just fit with the whole party atmosphere uh, and scene. And also just this kind of optic... Uh, optic view of, of desire and the optics of the female organ and cameras and the optics and optics. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> it was very cool. <laughs> Thank I really you. liked it. Thanks. Yeah. It's, you know, I, I worked uh, all through the 90s, I worked in this very playful way with performers. And then I got, um, as you can see, as I gra gradually, I mean, this isn't all my work, but you can see that I got. Um, a little more kind of locked into certain kind of uh, um, abstraction, for example, or things that are a little more formal uh, geographic stuff and um, working with found materials. But I've kind of recently gone back to working with uh, gaggles of girls. So we'll see what comes of that. It's really fun, but it, it um, you know, you evolve. So, you know, you, uh, that's the first movie is from 97 and the, and the, Kansas Atlas is 2019, so you do the math. You know, people grow and change and, you know, evolve and different things happen. And there are relationships, but maybe a little buried uh, in, the, in the... Well, you've got to see all my work to get all the connections. You'll be here. To, I'll walk you in the room. No, just teasing. Uh, capturing what? Ah. Uh, yeah, I mean, these are people that I've worked with quite a bit. There, there's a, a, an interesting almost, like I say from my early work, from when I lived in Pittsburgh, my early stuff, um, I'd often uh, just do improvisation, you know, kind of Warhol style, um, and, and in a confined environment. So you're like in a confined environment. So you have like a little community which kind of acts, acts and acts out or performs. So it's not, um, you know, you're not in the world. It's like a, it's like a domestic space usually I'm using. So there's a, um, there's, it's confined, but it's also safe. So I mean, a lot of the early stuff I shot uh, in my apartment on the south side, for example, 
or um, you know, a, a very particular locations. So this is kind of similar to that. The, the, the um, uh, well, you can see there's levels of improvisation. You can see that. <laughs> say that was 16 millimeter? The first movie was shot in 16. The one with like... Uh, with all the women. With all the women in The Last Supper? Yeah. And, and dancing around and kicking, breaking and scratching the records? That's, that's 16. Well, okay, it's 16, but then there's stuff I shot on Pixel Vision video that I transferred to film. So all the like weird, the text and the sort of weird blobby stuff of the... Of, um, it just it just an, um, it's a feedback effect that I did with the Pixel Vision. I've made other works with. If you don't know what Pixel Vision is, a, it's a, a fantastic toy, which was a Fisher Price toy, uh, which is now maybe you can buy one on eBay. I don't know. It's, it had a very limited lifespan, but it shot. Oh really? Uh, it shot um, black and white a grid that was 40 pixels across. Now the last movie you saw that's. 1920 by 1080 pixels, <laughs> as opposed to 40 by 40 with the pixel vision. So if you get close to anything, it just completely just turns into like um, a grid, just a back of my grid. Anyway, so that's, I worked with that a lot. I love that, it's a really cool uh, anti-video video in a way. It's a really fantastic. Uh, I met the, uh, the, uh, the inventor. There's this guy, James Wickstead who he uh, invented a whole lot of stuff, uh, he's from New Jersey. But um, really interesting, you know, how many people here know, I mean, it's like great to meet like an inventor who like gets patents on stuff and he develops crazy video cameras, et cetera. Uh, he did a lot of stuff for Fisher Price. Anyway, what was, is that a question or was that, would you just have a thought about the 16? I had something else to say. I'm, I was not. I'm not surprised. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I felt like the scene with the people kicking the 45 records and scratching them, and I love that sound of the, of the records being kicked. It felt very familiar, Peggy. <laughs> it felt like the colors looked like Super 8, and I felt like I could have been in that room. Yeah. Well. And it says yeah. something about the scene, capturing a scene. Yeah. Well, it's a Super 8 aesthetic in a way. It felt like it. Yeah. That's what I was actually asking. It yeah. felt like I was in 1980 Super 8. Right, right. The colors. <laughs> Something about the colors were very rich. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> I would shoot Super 8 now, but you know, you can't. You didn't. I actually sent, uh, this is an aside, but um, there's this place called Dwayne's. Anybody remember Dwayne's? in Illinois? Or? No, it's, it's uh, I think it's actually in Kansas now that I think of it. That's really weird. But it was the last place in the world to process Kodachrome. Literally, every, they had the last batch of developer. This place in, where it used a mail order place. So I, I went out and shot, I had this, I had all this, you know, Kodachrome in the freezer. I went out and just shot the sky. I shot 10 rolls of the sky just like driving around and shooting out the car, and just like the sky. So, and then I just sent it, and uh, so the, and the last batch of chemistry for Kodachrome, uh, so, so I have these, I never looked at them, I just got them back and put them in the, in the cupboard. But you know, it's just, uh, there was, I didn't, uh, it's for the, it's, they're I'm sure they're beautiful, but I kept, I'm keeping them as a fetish object. <laughs> um, I'm not a big fan of text on screen, and that first film, uh, like with the kicks coming across and trying to lean forward and trying to understand what it was, and then when it ended, the little sections ended, it was like a relief. And I was able to sort of like, you know, watch the women on screen or the jokes and all of that. So you have a lot of text in the early part, and then there's dialogue in your films, and then there's music in your films. Then at the end, it's like this long narration, but it seems like all of the visuals are like supplemented by either text or music or dialogue or now narration. Um, I don't know, just a little comment about, you know, the, the audio of your pieces. Uh -huh. The audio? Right. It's really, you're talking about text though. 
Te well, yeah, text, you're right, text. Uh, I said it really was like, it was a relief to sort of like not have to read that stuff for me, well, uh, which, which yeah. made the images more, you know, I was able to well, the, take them in. I use the text as an image. The text becomes an image, but I, but I and then read you it, have but, to then you have you, to read the pictures as if they're text. I mean, it's a con it's it's a really weird conundrum about cinema, that language is can you know that how language can be on screen. It's it's tricky, it's tricky. And this well, was my solution to make well, it. There's another step, and that that other step that you have to use is more energy or something. I don't know. But yeah, I, I, don't it, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about it, that. I, I mean, I'm not thought. a big fan of text on screen myself, really. But um, a lot of that work, that work is actually, you know, it's, it's about psychoanalysis. And it's about these theor theory people, you know, that the Freud, et cetera, Lacan. And so I, I had to represent them textually, because that's how we know them textually. And I did it in a way that I thought was imagistic as much as I could. And it, 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 the language performs a very important function in that film. That wouldn't be anything without the text. So there you have it. <laughs> okay, thank you. I just like, I found the text difficult to read. Okay. Because it was like coming at my. Okay. All right. Brain. I'll remember that for the next film I make. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. I, I, this, it's a good point, but, and it's not for everybody, but um, is there text in anything else? Uh -huh. I'm going to make you watch it again. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Hi. Hey. Um, thanks for that. Uh, I don't know if I have a question, but I, it's about the found footage work. Um, I had a sense that it was found footage, but I was also like, moving in between science fiction and news, right? Like some of it was mm -hmm. so recognizable and some of it was like, this is a projected future or this is like, and it kept, uh, I guess I'm just wondering about what your thoughts on science fiction are in working with found footage material, especially like fiction that is not necessarily imagined by you, but is imagined by someone else or a in the news kind of way, in a worldly, like, um, sort of uh, commercial or mainstream projection of the future. Yeah. Like how, you, and, and I think that kind of thing repeats in the, the earlier work, like, sorry, the later work. Um, you're like dealing with climate change uh, and the future that's projected and the disaster that's projected, but yeah, I guess just your thoughts yeah. in general about this. Well, there's lots of little overlapping things in, mm -hmm. in your comment, which is interesting. Um, first of all, fiction is really, like I was reading this thing about when people get older, they stop reading fiction and they go to nonfiction, and, and it actually speeds up aging. They're saying, the doctor was saying, old people should, should really be immersed in fiction. And I thought that was so beautiful because people get really worked up about the world as you get older and you gotta read the, you know, all the stuff about the government you know, every day and the, the war. But I think it's actually really interesting, sort of freeing of the mind. And um, everything in those videos with the animation pieces is factual that it actually happened. But of course, for us, anybody with a particular place in the world and you know, a particular point you're living, so many things that happen just seem fictional and they just seem unbelievable. Then we have the layer of fake news and all the false everything that's going on so nobody believes anything and everything you see on Instagram is like, you know, invented or edited in, you know, Premiere or something. So there's always, there's that. But I think um, the, the level of, I don't know if it's science fiction, but the level of fiction that you allow yourself in those movies I think is really important because it's such a barrage of things and I'm making these linkages that aren't literal. You know, there's like the Amazon package gets delivered and then, uh, then a cluster bomb drops, you know, okay. But emotionally and, and sort of like ritualistically, those things are related. And we understand how, we understand about those activities and the, vi and the representation of them that we see you know, on, on tel uh, in, in the news or something, on television, we don't watch television anymore, on, online, how those things are related. 
That's all I can say about that. So I felt like I was locked inside a De Chirico painting, a surrealist painting, where there was just one existential crisis after another with the found footage. It was terrorizing. Sorry. <laughs> and then I had two questions. You got so, it. You got it. <laughs> so uh, the 2007 with the special camera, yeah. there was a statement about war in the very beginning. Right. And then I was like 2007. Okay, so in 2008, Obama said Iraq was a stupid war. Was, that in, was your statement about the Iraq war, Afghani war, or just war in general? I think a war, a war in general. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a quote from Paul Virilio. He wrote a book about cinema and war. So I have the war camera that I'm working with, and then I have someone, you know, with the, it's funny because when with that camera, the glasses are completely opaque and the book is opaque, but you can, you know, because that's, that that's just the way the camera works. But I'm sort of making this collapse of war and cinema. And the quote is about, from Virilio, is about, um, the first casualty of war is the truth, right? So th in some sense, I'm just, l you're looking at an abstract movie <laughs> and it's, you know, and maybe it's more truthful or less, I mean, uh, it's just these metaphors are kind of stacked on top of each other. Maybe there, it's more truthful to see something with pseudo colors <laughs> than to actually see the real thing or as we see it with our eyeballs. But it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a particular, the short answer is it's not about a particular war, but it's from that, my thinking around that time. Uh, and reading that book and also, uh, you know, wars of that era. And it's not that different than any war, really. I don't think it would be different if it was not the Iraq war. It was the, the, the a bombing of Gaza. You can, they can make the same argument. <laughs> My other question was the first piece, the uh, stand-up, the jokester and the straight, the straight person who was just listening. I immediately thought that was, oh. I assumed that was you. No. And then when I read the credits, I was like, okay, that's not her. No. Who is that? And did she go on to do other things? Because she was just like Lucy, brilliant. Lucy, she was my student. That shot at Bard, and th those are two of my students. But it, it's, I think it's, it might, it's, maybe it's a little, it's terrorizing, but seeing them back to back, I think also is tough. <laughs> that, that is tough. And um, maybe we should have showed them apart. We, we showed them in chronological, we showed the movies in chronological order, but it, maybe those two should have been separated because they, they uh, the two animation pieces are actually two separate ones, the black sea and the falling sky. So anyway, it doesn't matter so much. Uh, you saw them, but, um, uh, seeing them not back to back is a, a, a little easier to take. But they are terrorizing and that's, I, I think I make work, a lot of work that's, that's terrorizing. But it's like I have been thinking through, as everyone has, virtuality and the internet and where we are as a culture and where war comes from and how we're supposed to process these things. And in some ways I made them both those, the, the Taiwan, with the Taiwanese animations, I definitely made those as time capsules to look at in 20 years. Mm -hmm. Like that's the idea, was the idea, that at some point in the future, we look back on this period and see what we have learned or not learned or how differently they can be experienced. Because it, it's, it's a mush of everything. Just the terror, the ter you know, just everything that's happening. Cause I, and I got it all from, the, from YouTube. But it is the, it is the cycle of, uh, that goes through all of our minds about um, the crises of our time. I thought the Taiwanese animations were really interesting and until I caught on that they were specific news references, they had kind of an instructional vibe, almost like the, the help manual you get on the airplane. Right. So there's right. a really interesting tension between the people to sort of following orders from some magic mind right and then it would collide with like a really weird representation of the real right so carry on good work <laughs> well I, I cut um you know they're like there's there's not a, a shot that's longer than like four seconds 
in both those movies. And they're just like this rapid. Yeah, um, I happened to run into you in the hallway outside before we started, and your prediction was I might not enjoy these <laughs> types of films, being the realist that I am, and I have to tell you, you're wrong. <laughs> and I also, as not being a fan of animation, those may be two of the first animated films I've seen that I really liked. So, to credit to you. <laughs> my, my question is, you know, I saw the first film, and this is very simplistic, I realized it's kind of slice of life film in some ways. Uh, not your average everyday suburban life or whatever, but a slice of life. And then we get into much more political. As an evolving filmmaker, as an, age, as an aging filmmaker, and you are, we all are, as one who has this long-term reputation, do you find yourself more, whether it's obligated or mission-inspired, to, to do more political stuff or to express more outrage or connections than you did, say, 35, 40 years ago? Uh, no, I don't know. Not really. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like uh, the, all the work's political in different ways. Even the early work that has improvisation, I work with a lot of women. It's very decentered narratives. You know, they're uh, alternative lifestyles. I mean, all that is, you know, all that's a certain pol politic. And I, just, I think maybe I'm a, it's a little easier for me to work with world events and not just my friends. You know, that maybe that has changed in that way and taken on uh, a perspective that's less personal. I, I say, I'd say that's true. But it's all, I think it's all of a piece. Um, and the, the, the politics, is, it's also in the fabric of the technologies and how I use them, you know, against, against how they're supposed to be used, perhaps. And, um, you know, my relationships with all the people in the films. So, I mean, that's a, that's a question, that's a, could it, a much longer discussion, perhaps, but that's, uh, that's the gist. Hi. Um, the found footage films, like, hit me in a very weird way that I'm still trying to process, but uh, someone earlier had said kind of that the first film that you had shown before the found footage films made them feel like, oh, I'm back in this time period, I kind of had this nostalgia. When those two films started, I had like a mild bit of nostalgia just in the graphic uh -huh. of it, because it's like very early 2000s video game, like CGI is just coming in, like that was my childhood growing up. But also all of those events and kind of how I processed the news or how the news was kind of given to me from a young age forward was like faster and faster and more and more crisis and more and more crisis. Yeah. And there was almost like a frustrating desensitization to watching it all, where it's like, it's not necessarily torture and like, oh my God, look at all of these things. It's just, why are you throwing it all at me again? I see this every day. It is every time you open the news, every time you open your like camera, it's, it's the same stuff. And I know it's all tragic, but it's like, it, it really like, through it all in this way of like, oh, you don't have like this emotional feeling for the tragedies that happen on screen anymore. It's like, but I you probably never did. Yeah, it's that's like the, that's a thing. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's it's a it's a, a a piece. It's a piece for self reflection. Yeah, and what and what and whatever manner you can manage that, and I think. We we all know we all know these events, but mm -hmm. to to critique them and to sort of process even the rapid fire nature of them, I think is that's our job. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so that I guess that's. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate sure. It. <laughs> Hi, um, I have a question. Did I hear you say earlier that? after like the 2019 film you are kind of going back to your like the gaggle of girls sort of thing that you're revisiting that sort of yes. form um okay i love that um i really like the way that you sequenced everything here in tonight's screening like the two animated piece i thought that was totally fine um and These are my curators in the back here well, uh, <laughs> excellent um yeah and i think like why I wanted to know if, if you're going to go back to that um, or if you already have was because that first film 
it made me feel so safe, like you, to use the word that you used earlier. Um, and it was like, it felt so nostalgic and it felt like I was just like, I felt like I was there. And then as the films went on, like then we removed people's faces and then we removed like the form, just the medium changed to now we're in animation. And then we were brought back to our dystopian reality with the found footage. And then we're brought well, back to like this apocalypse. No, I, I, but you have to be careful because I, I, mean, I worked for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And so we have four movies. It's, it's kind of like, try not to make a lot of conclusions <laughs> about this particular set of them. But it, you know, and, and it, generally, it's true that I've worked with fewer people on the last, but I, have just, I just made a, an hour-long video with a group of women imp improvising um, and up in Maine at, at, at a retreat. So, I mean, it's just, it's just the cycle of things, I think. And there's um, also different technologies give you different things. like. The drone piece is is like a woman's body. It's like the body of the woman abstracted. I mean, there's so many layers of uh, relationships, I think, between that film and the first film about certain kind of issues of representation and sort of sensuality of the landscape bifurcated and perhaps feminized. Anyway. Yeah, thank you. It was great. Sure. It was a wild ride. <laughs> thank you. And we have the last question. It's going to come over here. Thank you, Peggy, and thank the. I th want to thank the fantastic programmers. It's a great sequence of short films. Um, thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, I love reading texts on screen, and one of the one of the things that stayed with me uh, is a machine of vision. And you talked a lot about um, using different kinds of technology. And with each, there is a different machine of vision that is uh, anchoring how you're approaching the work. Um, and I guess a lot of people found the animation piece extra anxiety provoking because the machine of vision, uh, the, ca the camera is absent in that. Um, I wanted to ask you about various machines of vision that you are, have used, are currently using, thinking about, and how that is changing your work at the moment. Uh, well, yeah, I, I've used, um, like part of my thing is that I don't, uh, and some people have criticized me for this, I don't have a signature style, this is what they say. I don't have a signature style. And I think that's actually passe, the whole signature style thing. But um, I, yeah, I, I do respond, because um, I like to play around with technologies. So I, I, I do look at different qualities of visual technologies and what they can sort of bring, uh, sort of new ideas and a new way of looking at the world. So if it's pixel vision, you know, with 40 pixels across, 40 pixel grid. It's a very particular way of seeing uh, what's out there. And then, uh, to, and then to the drone is a kind of a whole different animal altogether. Um, I kind of uh, filter them, the technologies, through m my subjectivity, my own sort of personality and perspective, I hope, and uh, uh, not be I mean, there's a, there's a quote, it might be from Hollis Frampton, I'm not sure who said this, maybe Cash would know, that technologies um, become available to the artists once they're obsolete. And if they have use value in the culture and they're worth something, they can't really be used artistically because they have this other qu value in society, but once they're obsolete and the powers that be don't care about it, then artists can use it freely. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure, but it's a great quote and it's something I think about really a lot. Um, and I think that some, that guides me um, in um, my sense of freedom, I think, to use, to tackle different technologies and use them because I don't want them to look, like my drone stuff does not look anything like drone footage is supposed to look. It just does something else altogether. My favorite command, anybody fly a drone? You fly a drone, it goes out, and then you can't see it anymore, it's gone. And you're like, oh my God, I'm looking at your phone, like where did it go? But there's a button you push called return to home 
which is my favorite button. So the drone itself just figures out where it is and it comes and makes a couple of U-turns and comes back and then goes and plop on the ground. And that almost all the footage in this is from the return to home button <laughs> and not me composing a drone shot. So don't tell anybody I said that. <laughs> Thank you.